John Fitzgerald Kennedy was elected in 1960 after defeating Republican Richard Nixon. This was a very close election, with Kennedy barely beating Nixon in the electoral and popular race and losing some states to Harry Byrd, self-proclaimed champion of racial segregation. Obviously, the states that he lost were in the South. Byrd wasn't even on the ballot, the electors just didn't want Kennedy and ended up splitting their states. This was when the Southern Democrats really started to split. There was also some disputed claims of voter theft, but Nixon would get the presidency in eight years anyway, so who cares about that? Alaska and Hawaii were also now states. All 50 states plus D.C. from here on out will contribute to elections. Sorry, Puerto Rico, you might become a state one day. Kennedy was one of the most well-known political figures in his country before being elected, using television to his full advantage. He would also become the first Catholic president. I wonder why I consider that important. He is also the youngest president and remains that to this day. When it comes to the cabinet, the vice president was Lyndon Johnson. He was a Texan, just like me, who was brought in to help Kennedy with the southern states at least as much as he could. The Secretary of State was Dean Rusk, the Secretary of the Treasury was Clarence Dillon, the Secretary of Defense was Robert McNamara, the Attorney General was Robert Kennedy, who was also Kennedy's brother, the Secretary of the Interior was Stephen Udall, the Secretary of Agriculture was Orville Freeman, the Secretary of Commerce was Luther Hodges, the Secretary of Labor was Arthur Goldberg, who was replaced by William Wirtz in 1962, and his Secretary of Health was Abraham Ribicoff, who was replaced by Anthony Celebrez in 1962. Kennedy's cabinet was relatively stable and he would rely on their advice to get through any crisis, especially Robert Kennedy's, who would also target the Mafia during his time as Attorney General. Kennedy was ready to start his term. JFK was poised and charismatic, with many thinking that he was having affairs with a model bra with a Hollywood smile, getting that brain like Berkeley if you catch my drift with THE Marilyn Monroe. But I don't deal with rumors, I only talk about them. Getting back to the serious shit, Kennedy first had to deal with the Bay of Pigs invasion where, behind Kennedy's back, the CIA planned an invasion of Cuba using former enemies of the Castro government. This plot would fail, like the last time it was tried, almost a century before, and Kennedy would see its embarrassment through. The invasion started under the Eisenhower administration, and 1,400 Cuban exiles would be trained in order to overthrow Fidel Castro, who overthrew Cuban dictator Florencio Bautista in 1959. Fidel Castro also nationalized industries in Cuba that were previously owned by American companies, which owned half the sugar plantations and a majority of the ranches, mines, and other utilities. The U.S., wanting to protect their interests and keep the Soviets off their home turf, would task Jose Cardona to overthrow the Castros. The invasion forces were badly outnumbered and would be easily defeated by the Cuban government. Kennedy also refused to send in U.S. military in fears of starting World War III with the Soviets, a war which would be deadly considering that the threat of nuclear weapons posed since both nations had them, and they had them in abundance. Soviet leader Nikola Khrushchev was also making moves at this time. Khrushchev would build a wall, the Berlin Wall, in 1961, shortly after meeting President Kennedy. This wall would stop the free movement between the East and West Berliners. Khrushchev would also threaten to sign a separate peace treaty with East Germany, which could establish East Germany as the de facto Germany. Kennedy would send in the National Guard, and the Soviets backed down from this threat. Khrushchev did this as he was under pressure to stabilize the East German regime. Khrushchev had three main goals in Germany, stabilization and recognition of the regime, stabilization of the post-war borders, and an end to the Allied rights of occupation in West Berlin. By creating separate peace, Khrushchev was hoping to accomplish the third of these three goals. But like Kennedy, Khrushchev wanted to avoid war. He wanted peaceful competition between his Soviets and Kennedy's America. That concept would come to a head in 1962 and would be threatened. In 1962, Kennedy would be forced to lead the nation through the Cuban Missile Crisis, which saw nuclear weapons placed in Cuba by the Soviets. This angered the U.S. as the weapons were placed too close to home. The U.S. would blockade Cuba in order to prevent the Soviets from putting nuclear weapons in Cuba, but some were already there anyway. Kennedy would negotiate with the Soviets until a deal could be reached. The Soviets would back down in Cuba in exchange for the U.S. removing missiles from Turkey and promising to never invade Cuba. It was a very contentious time, and the world was at risk of full-scale nuclear war if either side decided they were done negotiating, but cooler heads had prevailed. Thank God MacArthur wasn't in charge. Full-scale nuclear war was avoided in the meantime, which Castro was not too happy about, as he wanted the U.S. and the Soviets to duke it out, and he wonders why so many people tried to assassinate him. Kennedy would also sign the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963 with Great Britain and the Soviet Union. This treaty would ban the testing of nuclear weapons in space, underwater, and in the atmosphere, which was a pretty big step to regulating nuclear weapons. Kennedy would also escalate the Vietnam War by sending in 15,000 military advisors to help South Vietnam in their struggle against the North. Kennedy saw Vietnam as the last line of defense against communism in Southeast Asia. He was also an advocate of the domino theory, 
which was the theory that as one country would fall to communism, others would too. Laos was already in the midst of a civil war up to that point. Kennedy wanted to do what he can to stop the spread of communists without entering wars, as he saw it as a road to World War III in the spread of nuclear weapons. Along with the advisors that were sent to Saigon, Kennedy would also fund schemes like the Strategic Hamlets program, which looked to make South Vietnam a little bit more self-sufficient, particularly with agriculture. But the funding would end up drying up, and the program would fail by 1963. Kennedy also ran into troubles as the South Vietnamese president, Ngo Dinh Diem, was a hard partner to work with. Diem was an autocratic ruler who consistently got in the ways of Kennedy's persistent request for reforms for South Vietnam. Rumors of a coup would make the rounds in August, and the administration was split on how to handle the potential coup. But the coup would die down, but by October, another coup would be brewing, with the administration urging the generals that were involved in the coup to get the situation in Vietnam under control before they would begin their coup. In November, the coup would happen anyway, with Diem and his brother Nhu being assassinated. Diem had previously worked with Eisenhower and the American government, and while not a sign of stability, the coup against him showed that the situation in Vietnam was becoming dire. Kennedy saw the instability and the inability to develop self-sufficiency, and reportedly wanted to jump ship from the Vietnam War, according to Robert McNamara, but considering events that you already likely know about, we don't fully know what would have happened had Kennedy remained president past 1963. Kennedy would also form the Alliance for Progress Initiative in order to aid Latin American states with economic development. This was done between America and 22 Latin American countries in 1961, and no, I am not naming all of them. The goals of the alliance was to promote the growth of democratic governments, growth in per capita income, more equitable distribution of income, accelerated development in industry and agriculture, agrarian reform, improvement of health and welfare, stabilization of export prices, and domestic price stability. The program would not have the results that Kennedy desired and would be dissolved in 1973. Kennedy would also establish the Peace Corps, which looked to provide Americans with opportunities to volunteer in developing nations around the world. The organization is still running to this day, and if you're looking to volunteer in a different country, I recommend volunteering with them. Kennedy would also push NASA to get a man on the moon by the end of the decade, something they would succeed in doing at in 1969. Kennedy's most important contribution to foreign policy was the development of flexible response strategy as opposed to the New Look strategy that was used under Eisenhower. The New Look was a response that involved the use of large-scale nuclear weapons to any provocation of China or the Soviet Union. It also involved not using conventional army as nukes already had enough power in them anyway. Flexible response, however, involved the use of military and non-military options. These non-military options included the use of diplomacy, economics like sanctions, politics like using the press. The military options included the use of different kinds of force like small scale or large scale. This policy gave the president the flexibility to respond to an event without nuking the shit out of the opposing nation. And this was most on display in the Cuban Missile Crisis. While he is more famous for his foreign policy, Kennedy also passed a lot of domestic policy, which was outlined in his New Frontier speech in 1960. Kennedy was a progressive that pushed away many of the Southerners in his party, especially after JFK asked them to get on board with his progressive ideals, which they obviously didn't want to. Kennedy took office in the middle of the recession. As a result, he pursued policy to lower taxes, protect the unemployed, increase minimum wage, and boost the industry and housing sectors of the economy. Kennedy would also increase government spending, and the recession ended quickly. Kennedy would put the spending to use through social programs like increased aid to education, medical care to the elderly, urban mass transit with the inclusion of a Department of Urban Affairs, and regional development in Appalachia, which would end up reducing poverty in the region over the next few decades. Most of these programs would encounter resistance, but some, like the increase in minimum wage, would pass, and others, like the tax cuts, would be watered down by Congress. Some of these, like the funding and education, would end up being passed by JFK's successor, LBJ, which is Lyndon Baines Johnson. Kennedy would also attempt to broaden civil rights. He put most of his effort into enforcement of existing civil rights laws, but would support the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which would end up being passed by his successor. But considering the effort that JFK put into it, I will attribute the success to both him and LBJ. John Kennedy would also send troops into certain places in order to force integration in schools. The most famous instance was when James Meredith applied to Ole Miss and was accompanied by the Mississippi National Guard. A riot would break out and a few people would die. Kennedy did a good job when it came to civil rights, but his civil rights record wasn't all that great. Kennedy was unfortunately forced to appoint judges in the South that were to the standard of Southern Democrats due to sticking with senatorial courtesy, something Eisenhower didn't have to do since the Republicans didn't have any senators in the South just yet.
These judges would try to get in the way of Kennedy's civil rights enforcement. Many were also mad at JFK for wanting to try and pass a civil rights bill in his second term, as Kennedy wanted to avoid a split in the party at his first term that would endoom the rest of his civil rights legislation. Kennedy would end up submitting the legislation following a confrontation of Alabama Governor George Wallace over the death of NAACP Director Medgar Evans. Kennedy was unable to see the success of the civil rights bill, and it would be up to LBJ to pass it. The Kennedy family would become synonymous with the American royalty, becoming the symbol of the prospering nation. The Kennedys were celebrities as much as they were leaders. My grandmother even had cups that celebrated Kennedy. She got them after his death. Everyone loved John Kennedy, unless they didn't. Lee Harvey Oswald, the CIA, or the Mafia looking for revenge over Robert Kennedy's relentless trials against them, or even someone else entirely, decided to give Kennedy some brain like Berkeley while he was in Dallas dealing with the feud between Senator Ralph Yarbrough and Texas Governor John Connolly before the 1964 election. This feud came with the danger of splitting the party, and Kennedy looked to have a show of unity between the two men touring Texas with them. Kennedy was shot in the head while riding in an open-top convertible with Jackie Kennedy, John Connolly, and Nellie Connolly, who was the wife of John Connolly. He would die soon after, and Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as president. Unfortunately for Dallas, that also wouldn't be the last time the guards let them down when it mattered the most. Kennedy's supposed assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald, would also be unable to provide answers to why he killed JFK, because he was killed by Jack Ruby, who would die of cancer before his second trial. All of this seems pretty suspicious if you ask me. I personally do not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was the only man who was involved in the Kennedy assassination if he was even involved at all. There were way too many people that wanted him dead for Lee Harvey Oswald to be the only man involved. Kennedy's legacy was that of a charismatic leader who led the nation through tough times. He would keep the world from being destroyed and spouse with the USSR, and would strengthen the image of the United States around the world. He was also a very key figure in the spread of civil rights in the United States. Kennedy did a great job as president. I will place him below Lincoln since he didn't have enough time to implement his policy, but he was still a great president. The assassinated bros gotta stick together. Here are the rankings. Join me next week as Big Dick Johnson tries to continue the legacy of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Toodaloo, see you next time.